come out of it is, is this issue of things. Because it's become patently obvious as we've started to use the vocabulary of things and objects that we are very mixed up in terms of this vocabulary. Things are not objects. Heidegger, and for better or worse with Heidegger, Heidegger talks about uh, the old high German word thing means a gathering, specifically a, a gathering to deliberate a matter and a dis discussion, a contested matter. So a thing might not be a material artifact. And maybe, maybe the modernity has forced us to identify that if I want a jumper, it's the, that's the thing. But of course I want a jumper to go dancing in and to become attractive. So we have to, it's very tricky, because I think we, if I look through the literature of thing and objects, people talk about things as though they're objects. And I don't think they are. I think things are things, which may well be the immaterial association or the occasions in which objects were present. Um, so Costas bought me a lovely um, lunch, and we, we shared a Coke. And the Coke bottle may well have been an artifact, but as soon as he had bought it for me, it became a thing, because it was connected to our time and space. The other Coca-Cola Coca -Cola bottles in the <coughs> chiller were still, were still objects. So things can be objects and things, but we have to be extremely, we have to be very sensible and sensitive about how we use those terms. Because I suspect we would be using that you've probably got conservators who talk about objects, perhaps, and then sometimes those things become things. And you might have curators who want to talk about things and then put them in the store and they become objects. And probably museums, your audiences, and everybody, the directors through, don't know consensually if your things are things and when those things are just objects. Because increasing the database surrounding that, which is already on Flickr, it's already on U Google, are constituting as much voice to make to, to, as an instance of that thing, as well as the object itself. So as I begin to close then, looking at what that might mean is that if everything is everywhere all the time, then you don't know what is your object or thing. And in fact, you're going to have to start adding firewalls to all of your things to try and retain some personal relationship with them. Um, so I'm not sure what that white shoe was. I'm not, I, I know what that is. That, that's a tent. That it used to be a carriage clock. It's not anymore. That's been tagged with the memories of Tracy Emin's tent. Because Tracy Emin's tent was, was lost in the Saatchi fire in East End of London. But it exists. I've searched the web, it definitely exists. I took my second year students to it in the Sensation Show, and I remember them walking in, crawling in, thinking, that's a tent, great. And then finding out that Tracy Emin had sewed all the people that she'd shagged, excuse the pun, excuse the phrase, in that tent and sewed it into it. So they came out all dirty, and it was great. It's really fond memories. So the thing definitely exists. It's a thing. It doesn't exist materially, though. It just doesn't. So maybe, maybe that thing can be a tent. Because actually, in this context, maybe it can be it can be repossessed. And possessions aren't what you think they are in terms of keeping things to you. Actually, possessions are absolutely open now. And it might be with a, assuming this technology just portray not according to IBM's story, but how museums are beginning to open up objects, you're going to find that all of these things will be possessed. Jesus, terrible closure. <laughs> but possessions aren't what you think they are. Possessions perhaps could be better using a ghost metaphor for ubiquity, because it begins to explore contested spaces. And if museums are contested, according to curators, oh, conservators, um, whoever, audiences, kids, and as I go in, it, it just isn't the same. And these things are only going to kind of tell more and more stories. So I hope that made some sort of sense. And um, yeah, thanks for putting up with it, really. Thank you very much. Right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the drinks are already there. Um, uh, but I think we will have a few uh, moments for um, uh, some questions uh, and kind of discussion with Chris before we continue the discussion uh, over coffee and tea uh, next door. So I'd like to invite anyone for uh, any questions, observations.
see with it is that it grew out of um, a search for consensual meaning. So they want what they do. They, the people, the engines look for consistency and application towards. And what actually that seemed to me when we were doing some work on it, that's what the top 40 charts do, though. Unfortunately, whatever is number one will stay at number one because more people listen to the number one and then buy the number one. And what it means is the thing that's at more interesting at, at the, the vinyl shop around the corner or the very small thing that just makes 39 won't be played as much because it won't score as highly in the Google aggregate. So it's, it's a, I, I take sometimes consensual, you know, looking at, uh, looking at flicker trends, you see things move in, particularly when they become political, that you want to listen to and find different when you listen to Radio 4 and then you listen to a local report. So I agree it helps us move towards, but sometimes some of those engines are all also funded and sponsored. So I suppose as an artist, it's also trying to find it's that, I mean, again, the consensual is sometimes useful and sometimes it's not, and trying to find a disruption to that to then unlock different people. Um, and we, we work with the TSD, and they still str genuinely struggle with, they take it, they let's engage the people. And it still feels like we can, they can just scoop them up with the right thing and carry them along on a wave of GDP PLC. And I'm, I'm not sure that's what we ever want the web to do, because I don't think we all know where we're going. I think part of this is an underlying critique of some of the databases that also... I, mean, I, I think there's an underlying problem with that. I think they can find more interesting examples. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. No, it's good, for sure. I mean, I've got, for me, it's, it's all about time. And I don't find any critiques of temporality. No. All that I find, the spatial turn, which implicitly is part of temporal, but I still think the databases are still chronological. We're writing, um, to do some work with the community in Wester Hale, and trying to write some delete functions for them on databases. So instead of databases accruing and never forgetting, of which then aggregates can be made, trying to write with some delete functions so they can reinvent some histories. Because as humans, we're pretty good at letting go and forgetting. And it's really important to terms of recovery. So my, my use of Internet of Things really hangs on that obsession with the linear. So if I, forgive me if I do ignore the crowd a little bit. <laughs>
has a meaning and a value. And other times, stuff is useful in the middle. Um, but it does seem very rich, and it does seem worth exploring some of the texts. We're working with the TSB, I'm sure they want an internet of objects because they want to recover the British manufacturing industry. Uh, so in other words, making more objects or um, machine parts. But I don't. sometimes they don't want to work with things because they don't really want to worry too much about the contested values. So that gets fuzzy. That <laughs> gets a bit messy in the internet. So it, it's a bit of a nightmare, but I'm hoping the nightmare's quite fun as well as we sort some documents and texts out. 